Ben Hyde. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. It's great to have someone on the program who can discuss the electric universe theory. I've been wanting to do that for quite a while. Uh, David Talbot, who is the brainchild behind the Thunderbolts Project YouTube channel, uh, isn't really good for any interviews now ever since he uh, unfortunately had a little bit of a minor stroke of sorts. And uh, Walt Thornhill, I've tried to get in touch with him, but um, even though I know he's seen my messages and all that, he... Um, isn't uh, getting back to me, hasn't gotten back to me yet, for whatever the reason may be, on um, doing a show about the Electric Universe. Um, so uh, I'm glad you were able to come on. It's definitely something w that needs uh, discussing because, uh, well, <laughs> great, I'm interviewing you on a Pisces full moon day. I did say that Pisces full moons are, uh, um, during the pre-show chat I had with you, that it's one of the best um uh, times for us to release what is no longer serving us and the nuclear fusion power stars theory is a bullcrap theory that no longer serves us that definitely needs to be relegated <laughs> to the dustbin of history and um, it's certainly worthwhile that we have people like you who are willing to talk about it. What a shame though that many um, uh, great like TV, I used to love watching the History Channel program The Universe but um, it seems like that show is still going to stick with the mainstream science thing. So uh, no sense in uh, listening to that and even some of the other prominent um, astrophysicists and uh, people who even talk about things far be above um, physics, like uh, quantum physics and all, like uh, Michio Kaku, that even he seems to mm -hmm. suggest that uh, nuclear fusion still power stars. It's a shame because um, the electric universe theory it seems to open up the whole new can of worms to so many things that... Uh, a potential for so many other things, not just um, the fact that allows for more life to exist in the universe because it doesn't have to be just be in the Goldilocks zone, among other things. We'll get to things like that later in the interview. But um, first, I want to set sure. a tone, though, for who you are and what you do and what you um, experience from a primary source perspective that caused you to do the uh, research that you do and the stuff that you do on the electric universe and any other fields that you do. For those that are not familiar with your work, I was most impressed with what I heard you say in whatever channel it was, whether it was Thunderbolts Project or See the Pattern, one of those channels that promotes the Electric Universe Theory, but um, now I, I will, I'm sure you'd be even more impressed when I hear what you have to say on my show. It's now your time to have the glory. I will shut up and put myself on mute. You've got the floor. I promise not to interrupt you. Thanks, Drew. Well, thank you again for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Because uh, like you said, you know, paradigms sometimes get stuck. And it looks like we've been stuck in this nuclear model of the sun, you know, for too long. And it's not that, you know, we're not, the electric universe, from what I understand, is not saying that this, there are no nuclear reactions on the sun. It's just that those are not necessarily the primary ones. But I, I don't want to get ahead into that. This, like you said, this is Ben Hyde. I uh, have a little company called Spark Science. It stands for Science Programs Aimed Right at Kids. And it's a little thing that I started uh, seven years ago. And I started it because I was sitting home one day. And, well, what it does is we do science presentations at schools and homeschools and businesses and parties, just wherever anybody wants to do some hands-on science, we show up, I show up and uh, explain some science experiments and, and turn them loose and have people just sit and have fun playing with different science experiments. But it started, like I said, seven years ago when I was just looking for another part-time job because, frankly, I was bored. <laughs> and I found a job uh, presenting for another company that did science presentations. At the time, I didn't even know that was a thing. But I went to go work for them. And during training, I sat in a schoolroom with my trainer. And he spent five minutes lecturing the kids on not touching his stuff, not touching his science stuff. And I know it was five minutes because after two minutes, I looked down at my watch and I timed him. And he talked for another three minutes telling these kids, don't touch my stuff, don't touch the stuff, don't touch the stuff. I'm like, ah, this is not how to get kids excited about science. So I, after that, pre <laughs> after that little fiasco, I said, thank you, no, this is not for me. And I went home. And on my way home, I'm thinking, I'll bet I could do this myself. I'll bet I could bundle together a bunch of science experiments and just put my name out there and start doing this myself. And I did. 
So I started volunteering at my kids' school, my kids' elementary school, and doing little presentations for them on Friday. And I started developing a, a, little, a host of bunch of different experiments that I could do with kids. Well, as it turns out, at the same time that this was going on, I was in an improvisational comedy class. And one night after class, a bunch of us got together and went out to dinner. Well, <laughs> as it so happens, the teacher, me, and one other guy were the old guys in the group, the over 30s, and all the 20 year olds were sitting at one side of the table, we were sitting on the other. So I, I knew the teacher really well, and I knew the other student, and I turned to him and I said, Adam, so what do you do for work? And he turns back and says, I'm a producer at Fox 13, which is our, of course, local Fox affiliate. And just tongue in cheek, I said, and if you ever need a science show, I know someone who can do it for you. <laughs> and <laughs> he's like, he turned to me seriously and said, yeah, I think we do. And from that moment, I started appearing on my local Fox TV station every Saturday morning, showing parents and grandparents and kids all these fun science experiments that you could do at home. That was seven years ago. And since then, I've started presenting at schools and traveling all around the state here that I'm at. I'm in Utah. And, uh, and it's just kept building and building and building. And it what turned into just a free hobby that I was giving away in my free time turned into a little paying gig, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> and it's just fun. It is really fun to see kids' eyes light up when they finally understand something or when they get to touch and play with the thing that you're talking about. You know, I mean, you and I have taken science classes. We've grown up. And we know it's just sometimes eye bleedingly boring when you get lectured at. But it's a wholly different thing to take science principles, I mean, deep science principles, and turn them into a game or a toy or, or a, a, a tabletop experiment. And that's what I've tried to do. I mean, I'm, you can't see this right now, but I'm sitting at my lab bench, and right behind me are bookshelves that are full of all sorts of boxes of science experiments that uh, I bring out and show to people. It was just, just everything that you can think of, everything you did as a kid, plus a little bit more, I bring out and do. Now, how this ties in with the Electric Universe is that I've had a lifelong passion for science. I've loved it. Why? I don't know, I was just born that way. I've been asked that before, and there's really no other reason aside from I was just born like that. And my particular field of interest was quantum physics you know, how, how the most minuscule parts of our universe work. And I just couldn't get enough of it. So, I, you know, I bought books, I checked out books from the library, read all sorts of stuff. But always, every time I would talk about quantum physics with someone else, I would end up with more questions than I had answers. And that's frustrating. It, it's hard to get excited with science when that's what happens every time you involve yourself in a discussion. And so I would get burned out. I would just, I would study quantum physics really hard for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then I just reached threshold. I'm like, enough, I'm done. And I would put it down and I'd go study something else or, you know, just watch comedians on YouTube or something. And then I found an Electric Universe video and I watched it and I was intrigued because the explanations that they were giving were simple. They were understandable. They dealt with things that made sense. And I'm like, wait, wow, what's this? And the more I got enmeshed in it and the more I got involved in it, that burnout that I experienced with quantum physics never happened. I, I could not get enough of the electric universe theory because they were talking about things in such a, a wonderfully simple way. And what I came to realize and what I came to find out, and it's, it's kind of dark and depressing, is that our, our current science isn't actually doing science. They're upholding a model, and that model is very lucrative. It pays out good money to build out huge super colliders and look for more and more particles. There's a lot of money involved in that. And unfortunately, that has always been the guiding force of contemporary mainstream physics. And mainstream everything else, but we won't go there. 
but with physics it is but the electric universe model part of it were you know people just along the course of history studying physics noticing pieces of evidence that didn't fit onto the accepted model and saying hey wh what about this piece of evidence what about this piece of evidence and we can go into who these people are and what what they found you know a little bit later but that's what they did and the electric universe just is kind of a conglomeration of these different scientists over the years putting these pieces together these dropped abandoned forgotten pieces together and saying oh wait this picture of the universe makes a lot more sense than the accepted model so there's there's a brief nutshell of how i got started will that do great great and um <clears throat> it's uh Great that you're um, someone that the uh, kids can look up to with science. Definitely need uh, someone to uh, make science fun and educational for kids. Um, I uh, have a someone in mind who I really loved as a kid, but now I can't help but frown upon and really despise. I am unfortunately talking about old Bill and I, the science guy. Yep, he, I knew his that. show was great back in the day um, with all the things that he talked about, but now it seems like he's definitely trying to further an agenda. I'm not really going to get into that, but um, among other things, uh, pushing the right. global warming fraud, but that's um, kind of out right. of the realm of this conversation. But someone like you who seems uh, definitely doesn't have an agenda and really wants to, well, does have an agenda, I should say, further <laughs> on the truth and uh, the truth about what is um the truth regarding what science is and what it's not um like right. in the, what the textbooks say and um i point out it's very depressing to see people like um neil degrasse tyson uh brian cox and michio kaku um push the uh, nuclear fusion um th power stars theory even stan friedman one of the uh, more prominent uh ufo um flying saucer buffs yep. he also kind of was unfortunately pushing the nuclear fusion power stars theory he said he was a sucker for nuclear fusion well yeah he was he <laughs> was suckered into believing the lie and uh well bless his soul may rest in peace it's a shame he had to pass away i was devastated here he passed away and uh yeah. i've interviewed his um comrade kathleen martin as well but um in regards to the idea that um the universe um the electric universe theory is really the way it it is um it, it kind of makes sense um i'm not i'm gonna try to not babble too much about what i know in one sitting rather do it in several different parts when i give you the chance to talk about each of those things here but one of the uh notable things that suggests the electric universe theory may be onto something the fact that the coronas of stars are much hotter than the surface of stars even though it's above the service of stars you never see um something farther away from a campfire be hotter than the actual surface of the campfire it kind right. of makes no sense that that's the case and uh the theories that they've kind of given have uh fallen apart seeing that uh um certain stars that don't do what some thought they is the cause behind um the corona being hotter do also have coronas that are hotter and um among other things and well the um idea that electric universe theorists have thrown out there is that stars don't get the their energy from the inside in a fusion reactor at the center they actually get stars for all intents and purposes are hot spots on a universal web of electromagnetic energy and for all types of purposes, planets and moons can be thought of as um, warm and lukewarm, and asteroids can be thought of as cool spots, maybe, on that um, electric universe web. So this idea that the corona um, is hotter than the surface because stars get their energy from the outside um, can be explained with, well, that idea. That idea right. uh, does that seem to make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, th when I first learned that stars were nodes on a string or we call them pearls on a string you know that really made a lot of sense and going back to the first thing you said uh, when i first started studying physics and before i even knew about the electric universe i too ran across that little tidbit that said that the surface of the sun is cooler than its uh, corona you're like wait uh, how does that happen? 
And on its face, that doesn't make any sense. But in children, you know, recognize stuff that, that does, doesn't make sense. But as we become adults, we just become accustomed to thinking what everyone else thinks. And so if a guy in a lab coat on TV says that this is what it is and it's a nuclear powered bomb, we just tend to believe it. With a, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it stares us right in the face. And that is just one of the things that it, it almost requires, well, it, it is, it does require a paradigm shift in your thinking. But I gotta warn you, <laughs> when you do a paradigm shift in your thinking, it's not just one domino that falls down. You're gonna have a whole string of dominoes and those dominoes might extend all the way back to day one of your life. So if you're not ready mentally to have your entire life domino structure fall down, don't look into this too much because <laughs> it's it's a little tough to go through. I've I've been through that twice now within three years and it's it's not fun. I mean, knowing that I'm exploring and finding stuff that actually makes sense is wonderful, but having, the knowledge that everything I believe prior to this just fall apart, not real cool. Kind of tough to deal with. Yes, and um, I'd like to uh, also ask you about another thing that has been discussed as evidence of an electric universe at uh, Walt Thornhill and um, also I believe Dave Talbot have um, talked about this on the Thunderbolts Project YouTube channel and many um uh, previous videos that i've seen on that channel and also the see the pattern youtube channel is another channel that's very uh, uh worthwhile listening to regarding the electric universe theory the um scars that you see on planets oh, like yeah. um canyons and like valis marineris on on mars the uh, mariner valley it um they claim that these uh things are actually the remnants of some sort of electrical discharge that when planets um, were closer together in the solar system many, many years ago, there was actually electrical discharge occurring. If you were seeing from a, if hypothetically from a spaceship outside, you, you, you would actually see for all intents and purposes, a static shock, a lightning bolt right. um, transfer uh, from the planets, between the planets and the remnants of that is the canyons and the uh, valleys and uh, gorges that can be seen on many of the planets. Um, so what's your take on that? And if you know anything behind the science, behind how that um, works, for those that aren't familiar with that, could you maybe get into that? Sure. So <laughs> that's a lot of ground to cover. Let me see where I can start. Well, you started with Valles Marineris, which is the big, huge scar on Mars, uh, as you probably know, it, and what your listeners may know, is that David Talbot, you know, one of the, the main voices for the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolts Project, did research on that from a mythological standpoint and discovered that many ancient societies had in their history, in their mythology, a god that was either called Scarface or had a scar inherent in his storyline, something like that. So he actually attacks the whole idea of, of Mars being close to us, close enough to actually see the scar. People who didn't have telescopes could see this scar on Mars. And you're like, well, wait a minute, was that the case? If Mars was close to us, then what actually would have physically happened if that was the case? Well, just like everybody can take their feet, put on socks, walk across a carpeted floor and go touch a metal doorknob and get a shock, that's the same thing that apparently happened in the skies with Mars. When Mars got too close to us or Venus and, and people might go, what, what the heck are you talking about? There's not e they're not even close to each other right now. No, they're not. But back about 10,000 years ago, the evidence is very, very supportive that our solar system was in a different configuration. And that configuration was Earth, 
Mars, Venus, Saturn were all really close to each other. And we'll just leave it at that for now. But Mars started uh, it, when the separation happened and when Mars and Venus and Saturn went to go to their final resting spots, as it were, where we see them now, they were, of course, moving. And as Mars moved, it got close to the Earth. And because we believe it's an electrically, well, we know that, that the planets are electrically charged bodies. When they got close to each other, there was dis not just a discharge. We think that there was numerous discharges. And we like to call those plasma discharges. I mean, you can call them lightning if, if that makes you, if that's easier to understand, that's fine. But for all intents and purposes, they were plasma discharges. And what's interesting about plasma is that it has many different shapes. It doesn't just have, it doesn't just look like a lightning bolt, uh, you know, in a traditional sense. It literally has been demonstrated in the lab, Anthony Peratt's work especially, has shown that plasma can take on different configurations. But the effect is essentially the same. When you touch your finger to a doorknob and get an electric shock, there is a tiny little burn mark that happens on your finger. It's so small that you usually can't see it unless you've got a, a microscope. And the same thing happens on the doorknob. There is a tiny little disruption of the surface. But imagine what that disruption would be on a planetary scale with a planetary electric discharge. We found, sorry, someone just turned on the sprinklers outside. That got a little loud. Let me see if they'll turn that off. Someone, the planetary discharge has very specific features. Like when electricity hits a surface, it will create what's called scalloping. And we can see scalloping on the edge of Vallis Marineris. It creates different depths and different heights. And that is something we see in Vallis Marineris. In fact, that's how we know that Vallis Marineris wasn't carved out by water because the valleys, the, the, the valley floor of Vallis Marineris is at different heights. of that and that's that's one of the arms of Vallis Marineris but as Mars would move close to the earth it would be repelled electrically and then go away and then have that same kind of interaction with Venus and if you look at Venus you can see these huge horrible scars on Venus as well one of the other things that is indicative of when you discharge electrically, it, it carves out canyons, but it also throws the material out, in, in this case, into space. All the rocks that got excavated were thrown around. And we know that happened because when we landed rovers on Mars, scientists were actually kind of startled to see these huge debris fields. And they're like, what would cause these huge debris fields? Debris of rocks is what I'm talking about. Boulders and, and rocks of all sorts. And in fact, if you look up any pictures of the Martian landscape, you will see that. You'll see it's just field strewn, strewn with boulders. And scientists weren't expecting that. Planetary science weren't expecting that. But that is exactly one of the things that you would expect if there was a huge electric discharge nearby, there would be a huge rainstorm of rocks and boulders. What's interesting is you think, well, great, science guy, that just happened on Mars. What about Earth? Well, it did. A group called Electric Universe Geology that studies possible sites of where these huge electrical discharges happen. And what's really cool, Drew, is that I live at basically ground zero for one of these events. I'm in Provo, Utah. Uh, but, 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 but hold on, hold on. I need, I need to interrupt you for a moment. I seem to have lost uh, connection uh, with you for oh, a no. moment, and my Skype recorder had um, uh, stopped making. And it, it happened before, actually, during your talk, but only for a few seconds, and then it went on again. Uh, but this time, for some reason, the recorder, when I was able to hear you again, didn't go again. So I'm going to have to ask uh, uh, that we hang up and then contact again. So if I may, just don't, no lose, don't lose your train of thought. Just um, stay where you were for a moment, and I will um, right. hang up the line and then call you back in just a second here. Hang on a second.
there you are. Oh, I see you have your camera on. Uh, you might as well turn that off because this is audio only and um, having the camera on may. Uh, all right, great. Yeah, I uh, I don't know what's causing this. There is a, something that I installed um, on my computer um, to help uh, with IP um, to prevent sabotage and all that from any sort of uh, gremlin that may want to try to interfere or hack my computer but for whatever the reason that thing seems to be really screwing with the internet connection and unfortunately i have to turn it off during the sky um during skype sessions apparently when i'm having them with the radio guests so um, i'm gonna turn that off i was hoping that it wouldn't happen but apparently it no did so let's uh from this point on where we shouldn't have any more glitches and from all shows onward uh i will make sure i turn that thing off now that i realize it is a problem because it did happen on the last show too um but anyhow continue okay so the electric discharges wherever they happen either on a planetary scale or in your backyard or in your front room have certain defining characteristics and that's another element of the, of the electric universe that I really liked is what's called scalability, meaning that the the thing that you discover happens, uh, you know, on the lab bench and it happens in, in the world around you and it happens in the cosmos and it happens on the smallest scale, like on the quantum scale. And these electric discharges that I've been talking about, you can replicate them and your lab bench. In fact, I'm sitting just a couple feet away from my little lab bench out here in my bike shed where I have an electric transformer, a neon sign transformer. It takes 120 volts and bumps it up to 12,000 volts. And it's really fun to play with. And I highly encourage everybody to do it. It's, you know, if you touch it, it'll shock you and it'll be like a, a mild taser. You won't like it, but you won't die because the amperage on it is not high enough to kill you. Amperage uh, of 0 0.08 milliamps is lethal. This uh, little device that I have here puts out 0 0.02. So it's, it's safe and fun to play with. That being said, you can take the two probes, the two electrodes, and, and hook them up to different types of substances. And what I've particularly done, since we're talking about electric universe and the electricity's uh, what it does with with dirt and soil is I get dirt and soil. I bring it in from my yard, and I've asked uh, other people, my friends, you know, anybody who hears any of these podcasts or that I've done, to please, if they want me to do this, send me some soil samples, and I'll put them under my arc, zap them to see what they do, to see how they react. And what I've noticed, and one of the very, very first things I did is that I looked at the scars that these electric bolts create on the surfaces uh, that I'm using here in the lab. And sure enough, there's pitting and there's cratering. Well, the, the interesting thing, let's stop it. Let me tell you about craters for a second. You and I, you know, have grown up our whole lives being taught that craters everywhere on Earth and on the moon are all because of impacts, meteoritic impacts. That's what we were taught, and, that, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being taught that because that was our best knowledge. Now we have new evidence which shows us that many craters, if not almost all of them, are more than likely caused by electrical discharges somewhere in our recent past. And what's cool is you don't have to just accept that. You don't have to accept that from me. You don't have to accept that from the electric universe. You don't have to call that bunk and say, oh, this is BS because my you know, professor at college said no. He said that it's all impact. You can actually do this yourself. You can go get one of these transformers that I've told you about. I, I got mine for free. The guys at the electric sign company where I got this from said, oh, we were just going to throw this away anyway. Here you can have it. I'm like, can I pay you for it? They're like, no, just take it. Which, which is really cool that we can do science so cheaply. But what I did is I took that and, and I literally created arc discharges on different surfaces. And then I got out my little handheld microscope and I looked at it and underneath. And you can see that the shape of them matches closer to the impact, to the supposed impact craters on planet Earth, on planet Moon, than anything. 
because some of these electric discharge craters have a raised mound in the middle, then the crater, then the crater wall, mm -hmm. and then a moat out beyond that. It just depends on the strength of the electric current that hit the ground at that time. If it was quick and fast, it'll do one type of crater. If it was extended and long, it'll do another type of crater. Another thing that we've noticed is that when there's a prolonged exposure of an electric spark on the surface, it will create a hexagonal shape. The lines or the edges of the craters will actually be hexagonal. And that is a property of electric current. We know that because we've demonstrated that in the laboratory. And not only have we demonstrated that in the laboratory, we have seen that on the poles of Saturn. Uh, if, you're, if your guests are really interested in science, a lot of them will remember that we sent, I think it was Cassini out to take pictures of the pole of Saturn. And they look down on it and they all of a sudden, boom, there's a huge hex, uh, hexagon on the pole of Saturn. You're like, where did that come from? <laughs> well, it comes from the, from electric discharge or the flowing of electric currents, rather. That's one of the shapes that it takes. But you don't have to you know, go out to Saturn to see that. You can literally do that at home with, with a, a tiny little transformer <laughs> and, a, and a small microscope. You can literally make and recreate the craters that we talk about at home. In your lab bench. In fact, I, I've I've had a bunch of people reach out to me and say, "Really? Can you do this? Will you teach me how to do it?" I'm like, "Yes, absolutely." So I, I'm in email contact with a bunch of different people, um, helping them create their own uh, little generators, their own little labs at home. Because it, it's it's one thing to be told a thing, and it's another thing to actually recreate it yourself. Mm. I mean, it's just amazing and fun. Yes, indeed. And interesting how you point out the uh, hexagon on Saturn and what you believe causes it. Um, I'm going to stay away from conspiratorial stuff on this show, but there are those who um, uh, who have read the work of um, what um, uh, drawing a blank on his name, but he wrote Ringmakers of, of Saturn and um, he uh, talks about how Saturn's rings, they seem to be of a uh, synthetic crystalline nature. And um, if you believe that uh, the, the could, Saturn could be like a crystalline radio, then um, perhaps the, uh, the hexagon there is actually some sort of a um, remnant or a byproduct of that radio. But uh, if you want to maybe silence the conspiracy theorists and say not everything is a conspiracy, folks. Um, well, not that this should be called a conspiracy, but uh, like well, the David Icke thing about the Saturn Moon Matrix, but we're not even going to touch that. Um, the whole thing that it's actually caused by um, what you said it's caused. What do you what do you say it's caused by the hexagon thing again on Saturn? Well, electric, the flowing of electric current charge. Okay, um, I guess, uh, well, electricity could uh, produce a shape like that there. We know that uh, certain frequencies produce um, certain uh, um, shapes and all that. If you play it in with like acoustics and also it's uh, not unusual. Well, now you're something. talking about cymatics. Y yeah, cymatics, but this is, um, this is a different... Uh, this is the, um, well, is there perhaps maybe a cymatic um, quality to that hexagon shape um, in, in addition to electrical discharge? Could there be something to that or do you not really see that being possible? Well, cymatics, it, from, from what I understand, is just, it shows, it, it takes the vibration of sound and translates it into a shape. So is that saying that there are shapes in nature? Oh, absolutely. Can nature generate shapes? Absolutely, clearly and unequivocally. Does that mean that electric, uh, electric, excuse me, electric currents can make shapes? Absolutely. In fact, that goes back to what I said before about plasma. Plasma discharges actually have distinct shapes. In fact, one of the reasons that we know or that we, we strongly believe that the electric universe has merit and has validity is because of stone carvings, etchings on stone from thousands of years ago that look almost identical 
to actual plasma shapes that have been recreated in plasma labs. It's called the Stickman figure. And I, I can send you links if you'd like, and you, you can put it uh, with this whole thing so people can look that up. Paul's right and left, I apologize for that. There, you can literally find this plasma shape etched in stone all over planet Earth. So do, does electricity create actual shapes? Yes, it does, absolutely. In fact, the hexagon on Saturn, we believe, is caused from a Birkeland current. And a Birkeland current is literally just, you can think of them as wires of electricity in space. That's, that's the kindergarten explanation of it. And that's probably the easiest way to understand it. But we know Birkeland currents exist. They were discovered at the turn of the century by Christian Birkeland uh, when he was studying the Aurora Borealis. Uh, he was laughed at when he made that discovery. He subsequently died because no one lives forever, apparently. And uh, back in the 70s, we finally set up satellites that measured these big, long electric currents that connected the Earth and the Sun and the Earth and other planets. And they were subsequently named Birkeland currents after him. So, yes, we, we do know that electricity does create different shapes and, and uh, configurations. Now, as, as to whether, you know, there are alternate explanations for it, I'm not opposed to that at all. In fact, a true scientist should not be opposed to quote unquote conspiracy theories because science is about the search for the unknown. If you make a declarative statement saying, well, that's a conspiracy theory, that's bunk, you're not doing science. <laughs> you take an idea, a conspiracy theory, any idea, and say, okay, great, well, let's investigate that. Let's create an experiment or two or three or 10 that can either add to that or take away from it. Because who knows whose idea is right or wrong when you're dealing with science? It, it's just, it's crazy to just, you know, have, take an idea and say, oh, that's stupid because I think it's stupid. In fact, when I teach my program to the kids, I'll ask them, I'll like, I'll, I'll take a balloon and I'll inflate it and I'll let it go. And I'll say, okay, guys, why did that happen? You know, just a simple little question. And they will come up with all sorts of fun little ideas. And I never, ever shoot any of their ideas down because that stops the flow of science. That stops the interest of science. That just kills creativity. And creativity is maybe what's needed to find the next great answer in science. So no, I'm, I'm not opposed to conspiracy theories. I, I am if there, there's a huge mountain of evidence that kind of goes contrary to it, you bet. But I'm never opposed to any alternative ideas. Right, right. Oh, it just occurred to me. Norman Bergrun, that's the guy who wrote Ringmakers of Saturn, talking about how the Saturn's uh, rings are uh, artificial constructs and they have a crystalline nature and they act like a broadcasting crystal radio, of course. Um, everybody knows there's no such thing as aliens, so uh, we're not going to touch that route at the moment. Um, but, sure. well, since I mentioned that, though, um, the idea of electric universe allowing for more life in the universe um, well, it makes sense. I mean, the idea of a Goldilocks zone is where a planets have to be in order to have life. Mm -hmm. Those in the um, electric universe theory would say, ah, oh, bullcrap. The idea is it is that because you could have, um, uh, if the electric universe theory is true, then uh, planets, um, if they're like uh, hot or well, stars or hot spots on the electromagnetic web. Um, throughout the universe, um, planets are the uh, cool spots or the warm spots, if you will. The There's energy transferred from the stars to the planets. And in my interview with John Lear, whole new can of worms there, he said, one of his yeah. insiders said um, that the, uh, the stars don't radiate heat. They transfer energy to the planets and the planets have their own filtering systems predominantly in their atmospheres that allow for um life to basically exist on the planet regardless of its size 
or location or the star's size location or where the planet or the star is relative to each other in distance wise in in its relative solar system <laughs> hold a can of worms here but the idea that we are so narrow-minded in thinking that a planet has to be in the goldilocks zone for life to exist the electric universe theory makes it much more possible for life to exist on planets that are far far from the sun or even really close to the sun because right. it's not like a burning furnace as we're led to believe because stars don't radiate heat they transfer electricity, send it out to the other to the planets to allow for well life to exist among other things. So, does that make sense to you that more life will exist in the universe if people well it could exist if the electric universe theory is right? Oh, uh, sure. Even if the electric universe theory is wrong, I still think that there's life out there. I mean, the the, the universe is just so catastrophically big. I, I think it takes a huge amount of hubris to think that we're the only ones around it's just that I, I i just can't get behind that idea at all but what's interesting is the electric universe from what i understand expands the idea of the goldilocks zone it doesn't eliminate it it just says there's more to it and one of the and i i, I don't maybe you're, you're familiar with this at all but the i the idea is that yes there are birkeland currents in space they do power stars stars are electrically powered and as such they can exist you know, all over and the idea or the evidence is growing that saturn was our sun a few thousand years ago 10 15 thousand years ago we're not quite sure when but when saturn what now saturn is noticeably smaller and, and and measurably smaller than our current sun now but since it was being fed from a birkeland current it was what we call a red dwarf or a brown dwarf well it's a brown dwarf star now but a red dwarf star and as that it has a very beautiful uh atmosphere and the atmosphere is of course full of red light which was very very conducive to life on earth now what's interesting is, is, you know i can say that and you're like well that sounds crazy but what's interesting is we have historical records and historical um, tellings of a time when there was a motionless sun in the sky. We know that, and, and that's what Saturn was, um, that's what we think in the electric universe uh, was the case, is that, we, that Saturn was in a motion, motionless position in our sky and we were inside this this wonderfully um helpful cloud of ionized plasma red glowing plasma where there was no distinction between day or night it was very very temperate um, and we have stories of that um, today we recognize those stories as in biblically we, we would call that the garden of eden um, every single religion has their the uh, oh, what did the Greeks call the or the uh, Dutch? Uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue, the Kata Yuga or something like that. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what it's called. But every single society has an ancient story of a paradisical uh, time in the ancient past. But what's also interesting is we know that in the ancient past we had what we call megaflora and megafauna very large plants very large animals the dinosaurs well what's interesting is that when the sun when saturn that was our sun it had a different electrical potential to it as did earth what that does is it changes the force of gravity so we're all taught right now that gravity is a constant, but the electric universe understands that gravity is not a constant. Gravity is a, is a function of the charge on a celestial body. And so as that charge changes, gravity changes. So modern biologists have studied dinosaurs, or specifically the, uh, the musculus, musculature of us, of other animals and of dinosaurs, and have figured out that dinosaurs couldn't actually exist today because gravity is too strong, which means the only way that dinosaurs could have existed on planet Earth 
is if the gravity was different. Well, how in the hell could gravity be different? It could be different because gravity is a function of electricity and our electric neighborhood changed sometime between when the dinosaurs were here and when we're here. You know, it's, it's just little elements like that that the electric universe posits that make you, makes me stop and go, wait, that actually makes sense. Because I, I know dinosaurs couldn't live nowadays. How, how did they survive? How could they? Just little things like that that are just absolutely marvelous. That uh, you know, some are, are better spoken than me and can explain that a little bit better. But just in a very general sense, that's uh, what I understand with the electric universe. Yes. Also, when it comes to the forces of nature, it's not just electricity. It's electromagnetism. But that raises the question um is it a percentage factor when we're talking about the construct of stars are they maybe a certain percent electricity and a certain percent um magnetism of course those in the um a uh, spiritual metaphysical community have talked about uh falls out of the realm of this conversation but like electricity that's male energy and magnetism that's female energy um but they must exist together and they're always found together but um <clears throat> some prominent um figures that support the idea that the star the stars are not powered by nuclear fusion have well, debated what the star actual construct is but they would assert that it would be more electricity than it is magnetism um of course the metaphysics would probably go along with that because they see star like the sun as being male energy dominant but um sure. making that whatever you will um the idea that the uh, what if you were to try to make a percentage of what the sun is constructed of and other stars for that matter um is it all like it's not i'm sure 100 percent electrical but where does the magnetism fit into this into sure. this thing well this is something i think is really well understood and that is is that you cannot have magnetism without electricity and specifically electrons in motion electrons you know once they move they create a, a an electric wave it oscillates up and down you can measure that but at right angles to that there is a magnetic field which also oscillates in the same respect but th th that th that may be too technical just understand that we've known for a long time that electricity and magnetism always go hand in hand you can't really have one without the other now you can have static electric events you know like rubbing your balloon rub, rub, rubbing a balloon on your head sticking it to the wall that doesn't necessarily make it a huge magnetic event that's more of an electrostatic event but again that's not dealing with electricity that's moving every single time you have an electric current that moves you will have magnetism be a part of that equation it they're inseparable now men and women are of course separate <laughs> you, you can separate them but as far as i i i actually don't know anything about the medical physical aspect so I'll, i should probably should just shut up about that i don't i don't know what i do know is that magnetism and electrically are are inseparable when the electricity is moving Okay, and um, these uh, Birkeland currents that you say um, yeah. are throughout the uh, the cosmos um, in the what is not really a vacuum of space. Uh, we've kind of been misled by that, and that's another thing we will get into a little bit later. Right. But um, these uh, currents, um, is it like if you were to um, – have a camera of sorts that could actually see them um if that's possible and makes sense yeah. um would it actually be like uh spaghetti strings in space or is it completely different in terms of its um, uh, appearance these currents that is that is a great question two things that we think we know about it one of them is that Birkeland currents travel in twisted pairs 
And what's interesting is so do Cat5 wires. <laughs> Electrical engineers here on Earth have found that in order to send a signal through your cable modem uh, wires, that the best way to do that is to take two matching pairs uh, in this and intertwine them. And you can see this. If you just have an old Cat5 cable, if you cut it off and look at it, you will see four twisted pairs inside. There'll be a blue, blue and white, red, red and white, brown, brown and white, orange, orange and white. And they are twisted together. And that's how we see electricity flowing in space as well. In fact, you don't even have to rip apart a Cat5 cable to see this. If you have one of those plasma globe toys, you can see that as well. Turn it on and you'll notice that the filament right at the end is split, it's bifurcated. And it, it's hard to see because it's plasma and plasma is kind of diffuse, but you will notice that it's actually a twisted pair. Now I, and, and again, I, I'm all about doing things for yourself to, to show it and demonstrate it to yourself. I actually have done this again in my lab out here with that transformer. I've taken it and I've put the electrodes about an inch apart. And we've learned that it, about an inch is what it'll take to cause a plasma spark to jump. Well, I've filmed the moment that that spark happens. And I filmed it with a camera and then I've, and, uh, I've actually I've videoed it and then taken a still shot of it. And sure enough, on many of the shots, not all of them, but on many of the shots, you will definitely see two filaments going from one electrode to the other. So when you ask about what shape is it, number one, it's a twisted pair. And number two, it looks like, according to Don Scott, who's another you know magnate in the electric universe, he has done a model of what he thinks a Birkeland current looks like. And for all intents and purposes, it is rings within rings within rings within rings. Almost like if you took those Russian dolls and like chopped them in half and looked down at them, you would see rings within rings within rings. And that's literally what we believe Birkeland currents are shaped like. Now, is there any evidence for that? Yes, there is. We have taken pictures of Saturn and well, specific, not of Saturn, but the one I'm talking about specifically is Jupiter. And we've had video of the pole of Jupiter and we can see swirling clouds on Jupiter going in counter-rotating cylinders. One, one of the rings is spinning clockwise, the one just inside it is spinning counterclockwise, and the one inside that is spinning counterclockwise. And, and uh, Don Scott pointed out that he counted like 17 different counter-rotating rings, rings within rings on Jupiter. And so that's nice, that's, that's Jupiter. Is there something closer to home? Yes, there is. There's a website here that you can go to. It's called nullschool.net, N-U-L-L-S. I think they misspell school. I'm not sure. Nullschool.net. It's a map of the Earth. And it is a computer model or a computer-generated model of the current wind patterns on the Earth. And if you go over the, the North Pole or the South Pole, and you go up, if you change the settings to go up to look up the winds really high in the air, you will notice that you will see rotate, you will see clockwise rotation, and then right about around the equator, you'll see some counter rotation. Is it as clear as as uh, Jupiter's? No, it's not. But then again, we're a lot smaller planet than Jupiter. You know, I mean, we're, we're tiny compared to Jupiter, so the effects, of course, are going to be scaled down and smaller but you can actually see that and you can demonstrate it you can demonstrate it in the lab you can demonstrate it you know locally and you can demonstrate it in space and when you can demonstrate the same thing over and over and over that tells you it tells me anyway that we're on the right path that we're the discoveries you know just that we're right there yes and the um, construct of the universe regarding the space between planets and also they um, say that the space between galaxies is about as close to a vacuum as you can get. But I um, contend that that's another lie that we've been told. It has been said 
by those in the alternate research community that outer space should be more thought of as a plasma ocean and among right. other things to suggest this um many of the things that nasa which ought to stand for never a straight answer well i prefer not always a straight answer to give them a little bit of credit for some of the things that they um that they sure. say that are true but anyhow the um video footage that apparently can be seen that they've uh gotten rid of or try to downplay what some people assert it is like you see a giant uh like a giant squid in space or something sucking on us on the sun and you wonder well what the hell is that thing it's uh well uh who's to say the universe isn't just one great big ocean and there isn't like it's not <laughs> teeming with life just like uh fish and squid in the ocean and they use uh suns and stars as uh, sources of food so That's the great, idea yeah. that it's not a vacuum um and how would that tie into the electric universe theory if it's a plasma ocean if that's our plasma membrane if that's a better way sure. of describing what the universe may be any thoughts i don't know I, I don't know what people mean when they say a plasma membrane um and that's fine what i do know is that scientists you know have told us that the universe isn't a vacuum as we think of it it's really 99.99 percent .99 plasma which is amazing i mean plasma you can just think of it simply as an ionized gas and it has it coined the phrase but he called it plasma because of its lifelike properties because we're uh, we had uh, excuse me hang on a second we just had the problem with the recorder going down god i hate to think that someone's trying to sabotage our uh conversation well, just, here because we're talking about these things you know, i but... just had a i just had a call come in oh. and i just i just hung up on it that might have been what happened really okay well yeah. if, if that's what's happening throughout the course of this interview if, with calls that you're hanging up on um if there's any way you could uh, prevent that, that would um, by all means do that. If you can't, then well, we'll just suck it up and deal with this. It happens again, but I am gonna have to hang up on you and then call you back um, again. So let's uh, hold this thought that you were on, and then I'll call you back. In a no, I'm still on my phone. Oh, okay. Just, hang on. Just let me see if I can get this. Oh my goodness, this, this sign in is just freaking oh, ridiculous. Oh. On my laptop. I, I thought I had Skype uh, downloaded already. If you want to download it, on, if you don't have it downloaded, if you want to download it, I can wait a little longer. If that's what you want to go about oh, it. Just, Do I have to hang up on you again, or can we just uh, stick around and I'll make sure I edit all this? Uh, uh, when I chop down the video, it's going to be a, a burden, though, because I got like um, five or six different. Uh, of recording sessions with you and I got to combine into one here because of this little glitch here that's caused you to get disconnected. I'll, I'll find a way to get it on. It may take a little bit, but I'll. Sorry, man. I've done editing. I know what a pain in the ass that is. I'm sorry. It's cool. Um, it's it's not even recognizing my phone number. This is stupid. Really? It's right there. It's right here. I don't know why this is not. Uh, why it's. Come on. Okay, hang on. I may have it. Okay. Let's see if that'll do it. Nope, that wasn't it. Ah, there we go. Four. My goodness, this is a lot of security. Okay, screw that. That's into your pet. Ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, okay. Andrew, let's just keep doing this on the phone. That's the computer's uh, not uh, okay. Not cooperating. All right, all right, all right, fine. So, um, it, I got the recorder going now. I will, uh, edit that 
chit chat out um when i sure. upload this so <laughs> did, hopefully you didn't lose your train of thought um you were talking about um well the plasma uh nature of the the universe and all that but um i seem right. to have forgotten where you specifically were but um do you remember i well the i i do okay the we know that the plant that the universe is actually not a vacuum or a void it's 99 percent plasma and plasma is an excellent conductor of electricity and so the idea that we can that there are actual strings of of uh, charged particles you know currents of electricity in space is not a far reach at all now it is if you believe that the universe is a vacuum but we have since you know discovered that it's not the universe is is basically a, pl a plasma verse is what we can call it so the idea that there are actual birkeland currents in space is not a stretch in any sense of the imagination in fact as as nasa keeps doing different um different experiments with their different probes they keep discovering what they call what they're calling stringy things that connect planets <laughs> they're like guys it, it's not stringy things it's birkeland currents and we've known about them for a long time but that kind of just shows the reticence to change the model, which is unfortunate. You know, science is not about holding on to a model. Science is about adjusting your model when new data comes to light. And it's just, it's weird that NASA is the one both collecting the data and being reticent to change their model. <laughs> That's just, it's, it's kind of funny and bizarre and sad at the same time. Well, then again, that's what I should stand for uh, not always a straight answer. Now, uh, have you by any chance looked into the uh, idea of what dark matter and dark energy may be? Is this something that Electric Universe um, enthusiasts uh, care to try to answer or uh, sure. not really? Oh, no, absolutely. The interesting thing is, is that dark matter and dark energy are undergoing something right now that is like a child's game and the game that i'm thinking of specifically is whisper down the lane and that is where you have a group of your friends and you tell your friend sitting next to you you whisper them a little secret saying you know i like johnny because his hair is brown and he smells like chocolate chip cookies and then that person whispers that same thing to the person next to them. And of course, as we all know, as that story progresses around the circle, it changes and, and it finally ends up with, uh, I have a fish named Johnny that doesn't smell very good and he likes to lick giraffes. You know, it, it just, it completely changes. Well, that is the same kind of thing that's happening with dark matter and dark energy. In fact, your question really illustrates that point very well because we're now talking about dark matter and dark energy like they are actual physical things but when they first emerged in the scientific community they were not physical things they were placeholders in the same way that in algebraic equations you use letters to take the place of numbers no one thinks that an X or a Y actually represents a physical number five or six. They're placeholders for any given number. And scientists, you know, looked out in the universe, cosmologists specifically, and saw the rotation of galaxies and then measured how much matter was in the galaxies and put it into their equations and figured out that the galaxies were spinning way too fast and generating way too little gravity to hold everything together. So their conclusion was, and this is where it went wrong, is that, well, there must be something else out there holding the galaxies together. And that something else was just a placeholder. It, it was never an actual thing. They said, well, it must be, it must be dark because we can't see it and we can't measure it. And so we'll just call it dark matter and dark energy. That's kind of a, a brief synopsis of, of where it came from. But in the electric universe model, there's no need for that. There is no need for dark matter and dark energy because our understanding is that it's not, that gravity is not the predominant force in the universe. It's electricity. 
we're not saying that we don't believe in gravity or that gravity doesn't exist. It does. It's just so much weaker than electricity, than the electric force, that it makes gravity irrelevant. And so when you start putting together the equations using an electric model of the universe, suddenly you don't need placeholders like dark matter and dark energy at all. They're just, they, they don't exist. And, and I, I've actually demonstrated this with, and in fact, you can do it at home too, uh, with a fun little experiment. And in fact, I'm looking at it right now. I have some needles, sewing needles, right? And I've attached them to strings and you can uh, suspend those horizontally if you use a magnet. So you tie the strings onto, onto something and stretch them out and have a magnet sitting right across from them. And, and if you back the magnet up to where they're just not, the needles are just not touching the magnet, so they're suspended in the air, you can do this experiment. And it looks really cool anyway. So with the needles suspended horizontally, you take your blowtorch and you light up the needles. You make them glow red hot. And as soon as they do, they lose their magnetic attraction to the magnet and they fall away. And that is exactly the relationship that the electric universe talks about gravity and electricity is that mag in, in this little cute little experiment, magnetism is a strong force, but when you add fire <laughs> to it, you disrupt it because fire is so much more stronger. In likewise, gravity is a, is a great force. And when we use it every day, I mean, it, it's critical to life on earth but it pales in comparison with the electric force. In fact, it's been measured. There's a difference. Electricity is a thousand billion, 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 billion times as strong as gravity. And so <laughs> as soon as you realize that, you can understand why the electric universe wouldn't even have a need for dark matter and dark energy, because electricity is so much more strong. Wow, that was good grammar. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly more powerful than gravity. In fact, one of the uh, other uh, uh, voices of the electric universe said that, that gravity only takes over in the ashes of electrical discharge phenomenon. And that's kind of the idea of where our solar system is right now. We had huge catastrophic electrical discharge phenomenon, you know, 10, 15,000 years ago or so, or maybe longer. And after that settled down and the planets settled down in their orbits where we see them now, gravity is able to step in because there's no more huge electric discharges happening and going on. So there's no need for it. I guess that uh, that's a sensible way of seeing it. Uh, no need for it if you can um, explain it away with something else. And um, well, one thing we also need to explain away is the idea behind how supernovas and black holes are formed because they are both based on the um, nuclear fusion power stars theory. So if that's wrong, then the idea behind how supernovas are uh, go about um, causing stars explode in that way and how black holes are formed in the way that mainstream science says that they're formed must also uh, be wrong. And as well as the um, stars that change their phase and shift into different forms because they've aged and and whatnot that's not the, the the same either so why don't we try to kill many birds with one stones here supernovas black holes and the different nature of stars as they change when they age it's not the way we're led to believe it is because nuclear fusion power stars is wrong so how do we uh explain those things electric universe style sure well, you've hit upon one of my bugaboos, one of the <laughs> one of my pet peeves, and that is black holes. So black holes are another thing that has come into the public understanding as an actual thing, a monster in space, a, a giant sucking vortex of blackness that you can't see that will destroy you and your solar system, and there's nothing you can do about it. 
it's just a horrible, horrible story. And that it, the truth on that has just been exaggerated beyond belief because what happened was black holes <laughs> were a mathematical creation. They were made on paper. And <laughs> it's, it's because it, it simply worked like this. Scientists could measure gravity and they, and they sat around and speculated and said, well, wait a minute, what about if there was a star that was so massive that it got, it could keep light from escaping? You know, what would that look like? But instead of looking in a telescope for that, they did it on, on paper first. And they said, well, it would look like this. And they created the idea of a black hole on paper. In fact, it wasn't even called a black hole when it was first created. It was called a singularity. And it was uh, just kind of assumed that it was a real thing. And so when astronomers went out to go look for it, all they went to look for was just a highly gravitationally or energetic point in space. And of course they found one because there's lots of energetic points in space, but they misinterpreted it as a black hole because it fit their equation. And, and here's one thing that I, it really gets me. One thing that uh, Walt Thornhill, he's actually a pretty good friend of mine now, which I'm very pleased to say, he has constantly belabored the point that math is not physics. And I've picked that up. Math isn't physics. In fact, he talks about how math was, was supplanted physics back before our grandparents were born. And that it, it's really unfortunate. And I can demonstrate that math isn't physics. This is how I do it with my kids. I, and, and this is going to be a little weird just uh, because we're listening to it, but you can do this yourself. Right now, I'm holding up my index finger and I'm saying, here is one finger. And now I'm putting my finger down. Here is zero fingers. Now, show me anywhere in the known universe where a negative one finger exists. Well, you can't because that's a nonsensical idea. But on paper, Mathematically, a negative one finger is just fine. Mathematics uses negative numbers, imaginary numbers, letters for numbers all the time. But to think that those actually, tr that those numbers translate into physical objects in the real universe is where contemporary physics went wrong. That science, I'm sorry, mathematics is not physics. It can be used to describe properties of physics, but unfortunately, right now, it has completely supplanted the tangible physical aspect of physics. And that's what happened with a black hole, is mathematically, we created this object and then just assumed that the most powerful energetic object that we can measure in sky is a black hole. And it's just, it's not the case. It... <laughs> Okay, sorry, just need to take a breath on that just because that, that really kind of gets my goat. The other thing that got my goat is that this last year we had, you know, before all this COVID craziness, we had scientists uh, pointing out that, hey, we've got our first picture ever of a black hole and they created press conferences for it and they showed it and for some reason it kind of looked like a donut, which is an electric universe model thing, but we'll, I'll leave that for just a minute. The problem is that was not the first time we had imaged a black hole. I'm old enough to where I remember the news. I, I follow science news. And I remember that scientists, that the news media said years ago that they had their first ever image of a black hole. And I found it. I went on Google and I found it. So this whole idea that science is being fed to the public and what they're being fed is is correct and right is just demonstrably wrong it's not it, it's like the news media if it's out of sight it's out of mind it's like whatever they're saying is the reality at the time it has nothing to do with history and if you don't pay attention to history you're going to be deceived in, in science and in every other facet of your life. 
because that's what happened with black holes. I, I have it on my computer. <laughs> I, I can show you the picture that they said was the first ever picture uh, of a black hole. And that was took place like two or three years ago. But then they came out and said, here it is again. So the electric universe idea of a black hole is that, yes, there are these huge energetic entities in space. Do they suck and gobble up stars and planets? No, no, they don't. These huge energetic celestial objects, are, we believe, are plasmoids. And a plasmoid is a perfectly good energetic thing. And you can think of it as a donut, a smoke ring is a toroid there's a pla it, it, it's it's a toroid a toroid and a plasmoid are the same shape sorry if that was confusing it's a donut shape and we can see it like i said make smoke rings that's a that's a toroid and we believe that electricity when it gets concentrated tightly enough one of the shapes that it takes is this toroid which we call a plasmoid and that plasmoid is just it's a concentration of electricity. And so, and, and since we believe that electricity, that gravity is a function of electricity, if you're going to have that much electricity concentrated in one area, the gravity is going to change. And gravity is all about what black holes are. You know, gravity is, is just this infinite, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm making fun of black holes here because it really kind of gets me. But we talk about black holes as if they have an infinite, uh, reality to them you know that once you cross the threshold the uh, that you won't be able to escape and that you're infinitely trapped in there well the problem is is that infinity is not a number it's not an actual thing it's a concept again it's a mathematical concept that doesn't actually it, it doesn't indicate reality it doesn't demonstrate reality in any way but infinities are intricate and and as a part of understanding the mathematics of a black hole. I'm just like, Ugh. okay, I'd probably, I'd probably beat that horse to death too much. Let me go to, um, you said um, supernova, right? Was your other one? Yeah, and that supernovas. is, right. So supernovas are, are fascinating. We, we all understand the supernova is just an explosion, a star exploding. Well, the problem is, is that a few years ago, scientists measured or witnessed a star going supernova. This was about 50 years ago, they, they witnessed it going supernova. And then just a few years ago, they witnessed the same star going supernova again. And that's of course impossible. You can't blow up and then blow up again because you don't exist. But in the electric universe model, that is understandable and acceptable. You can do that because stars are not powered by nuclear reactions at their core they're powered from they're powered externally from without by these huge birkeman currents well one of the effects that we have seen and demonstrated in the lab the sapphire project is a perfect example and you can see beautiful pictures of this sapphire s-a-f-i-r-e is that when electricity melts with a planet or forms a star, it creates something called double layers. And that's kind of a, it's a really weird um, name and it's kind of hard to understand, but a double layer is essentially layers. I don't know why they call them double, I don't know. They're, just, they're, they're layers. I mean, imagine taking a birthday cake and putting blue frosting on it and then putting red frosting on it and then putting yellow frosting on it and then putting brown frosting, uh, not brown frosting, but you know, purple frosting, orange frosting on top of that. If you cut the cake and look at it, you will see all those different layers. Those are what's called double layers. And stars have double layers. We have, like I said, the Sapphire Project demonstrated this. Now, these double layers are actually electricity. And the reason they form layers is because electricity, as we all know, is made up of positive and negative components. Well, all the positives get together and have a party and all the negatives get together and have a party and they form these layers. Well, if they ever get disrupted, if a, if a single layer ever gets disrupted, it's just like an arc discharge. It's like if you, if you pull out a plug and drop a screwdriver on it, boom, you get this big, huge electric discharge. And that's what we've seen. That's what the electric universe believes happened with supernovas is it's just some of these double layers essentially shorting out and going 
It's a huge, massive, beautiful explosion. But it doesn't change the fact that there are other double layers that are still there. It doesn't change the fact that the Birkeland current feeding the star is still there, which tells us how a star can survive a supernova. Now, do, do we know that absolutely fact? No, but that, that's the idea. That's the model that we're working with. And we, 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 of course, look for evidence to support that. I think the last thing you asked me about was, it was something about stars, about their nuclear fusion model. Um, what was the actual question with that? Oh, well, I was just pointing out how um, <clears throat> black holes and uh, supernovas show that um, the well, the, the, the nuclear fusion model is what oh, right. it's based on, so it can't be um, true, the explanation, because if that's not true, then the explanation for how supernovas and black holes exist based on right. the nuclear fusion model must be wrong. So we had to um, move on to uh, some other thing. Um, I, let's, I, I can address that a, a little bit. Yeah. There's a little more. And let's not... I, see, I, I'm very passionate about this, as you could probably tell, and I like to talk about things in terms of right and wrong, because that just makes me feel good. But the more I study this, the more I realize maybe a better word to describe what the current model is, is incomplete. Because to call it totally wrong carries with it the idea that we need to throw it all away. And there's definitely parts of it that we do need to throw away. Do we need to throw all of it away? No, we don't. Because the Sapphire Project has demonstrated nuclear reactions in their Sapphire engine, which tells us that, yes, there are nuclear reactions going on in our sun. Are they the most predominant ones? No, no, they're not. But are they there? Yes, they are. So to say that the nuclear model of the sun should be completely discarded doesn't do it justice. That, that's not right because there are nuclear reactions. It's just incomplete. And so we don't have to, we don't have to, I used to make fun of, of modern science and say, oh, these bunch of idiots, I don't know what they're doing. They're, you know, here, here's the real truth. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to go there. Let's just call it incomplete because there are elements that are still true. Yes. Oh, and I now remember what what else it was. Um, the uh, third thing about uh, the stars are different classifications: brown dwarf, oh, red right. dwarf, uh, super giants, and uh, and whatnot, uh, neutron stars, and um, and such. Well, they're all, of course, based on the nuclear fusion thing. So um, there they, they can't be. Uh, the truth behind how stars morph or change or become different uh, classes of stars as they age is is wrong. So if stars do exist in different forms, be they red dwarfs, um, white dwarfs, um, neutron stars, um, super giants, and, and whatnot, um, how does um, Electric Universe explain how they change as they age or um, right. and form and whatnot? Sure. So. No, great question. How do they change as the age? Well, I'm not sure if that's the best way to ad address the question of stars. I mean, they obviously age. We change as we age. So we're thinking, well, stars will change as they age too. But it's not necessarily that the age is what does them in. That's more of the idea of a nuclear furnace running out of fuel. And so they change color and change size. And, and that was our old understanding. The new understanding is that stars, are of course, powered by intergalactic bur galactic Birkeland currents. And so when they change from one to another, from one size to another, from red dwarf to white dwarf to you know all these different kinds, that is more likely a function of the amount of current flowing in the Birkeland current. And so when a star changes, the reason it changes is because the amount of electricity flowing to it has either increased or decreased. Simple, easy peasy. Now, as far as the different type of stars, and, and you mentioned one of them that I wanted to address, like a neutron star. Again, a neutron star, this is the same thing that happened before is scientists figured, you know, they saw this star and it was sending out pulses. So they figured, well, it had to have been spinning very fast to do that. But when they did the equations on it, they, they found out that it was spinning like 300 times a second. Now that's ridiculously fast for a star to spin. 
In fact, it's too fast for it to spin. It would actually, be, there would be so much centrifugal force that it would actually fling itself apart. It couldn't actually do it. So scientists said, well, the only way for this star to work like that is if it was made completely of neutrons. The only, <laughs> and so voila, the idea of neutron stars was born. But it was never actually measured. That's the point. It was created mathematically because the data that they had didn't fit their equations. And, and so they just made it up. And you're like, no, <laughs> no, you don't do that. You do it the other way. You take the, the, the data, the, uh, the measurements, and then you find the mathematics. You don't find the mathematics and then go look for the data. I mean, you, you can do that. And that's fine. But just so long as, as if the data doesn't match the math, then you discard the math. You don't discard the data. But neutrons <laughs> have never been seen anywhere to hold together like this, except for magically in space, in a neutron star. They're, they're just, they decay in a laboratory in like 15 minutes if, if they're isolated. And you're like, uh, okay. And all of a sudden you realize that the whole idea of a neutron star is just another one of these fanciful things that we have told ourselves to make our mathematical equations work. And Drew, that's not science. It's supposed to be the other way. We're supposed to discard our theories, discard our models when the evidence shows us something to the contrary. But current scientific thinking is just the opposite. We hold on to our models and discard the evidence. And you're like, no, no, don't do this. Please stop doing this. So the different kind of stars that we have are, you know, they're all sorts of different sizes and different colors, but we see that as a function of how much current they're getting. Now, that, that's a watered down version of what's going on. And frankly, we're still studying that. And we're, and we're still, I mean, it's an active field area of, uh, of exploration. So if anybody's out there interested in stellar astronomy, boy, there's, a, there's somewhere to go. Figure out why stars are different colors and, and different sizes and why they have the lifespans they do. Excellent way to, excellent field of research. No doubt. And other things, uh, other things that need to be uh, researched, I'm sure, are the true nature. Because, um, again, if uh, the nuclear fusion theory is wrong, then our understanding of, well, uh, sunspots um, and also coronal mass ejections and solar flares um i i think i've said i've heard that there's a difference um between coronal mass ejections and solar flares they are the same in fact i've even heard uh, uh one you can tell the difference between the other of how things are done on uh, racked on earth like uh coronal mass ejections seem to be of a positive nature when the stock market rises and the economies are great <laughs> but when everybody's um pissed off and unhappy and the stock market goes down that's when solar flares are happening so by that token they can't be the same thing if they change the way we behave on earth um but if they um are if that is the case then what's the difference and also what's the difference between how nuclear fusion bullcrap theory of what um they are is um explained versus the electric model universe theory explaining what coronal mass ejections and solar flares and also sunspots what um are sun to sunspots in the electric universe theory sure I, my understanding, and, and I'll be, be wrong with this, I, I thought coronal mass ejections and flares were the same thing, so I, I can't really speak to that because uh, I don't know. One thing that is interesting about sunspots, however, is that we all know that sunspots are dark. And sunspots are actually holes in the surface of the sun where you can see below the surface of the sun. And <laughs> the sunspots are a dead giveaway, a nail in the coffin that the nuclear free furnace model is BS. Because if there's a nuclear furnace at the core of the sun, that should be hot and very, very bright. It should be the brightest part of the sun. But when you poke a hole in the sun <laughs> with these sunspots, they're dark which tells you that down deeper in the surface of the sun, it is darker and thus cooler, not hotter and brighter. So yeah, sunspots are, are wonderful. I mean, they're, they're fun to watch them and they're, they're actively being studied right now. 
as to what they're made of. Uh, we're talking it as our resolution of our telescopes gets better. We can see what looks like the, the plasma tufts, the little the little parts, the little segments of the surface of the sun. Um, it's I think I heard Wall Thornhill talk about them as being plasma tornadoes, which is is fascinating. And I think Don Scott has said the same thing that they are essentially electric plasma tornadoes, which is fascinating because that makes me want to look at the tornadoes here on Earth and find if there's any electrical components to them. And when I've done research on that, I've found that there actually is. And one of the things, and this is this is getting in the realm of a little Ooga Booga here, but it, it's still, and like I said, I don't necessarily dismiss Ooga Booga at all, because it's reported and you will just create experiments to validate it or invalidate it. But it's the idea that that certain people have reported that tornado that inside a tornado there is an anti-gravitic effect. Now, of course, the Wangs will immediately say, well, duh, it's a fast wind and it's just lifting you up off the ground, dummy. It's like, yes, that absolutely happens. We can see the debris and detritus around the cloud of a tornado. But has anyone ever looked for an electrical effect of it within a tornado? See, I don't know that they have. And since we believe that, elect that gravity is a function of electricity, and if tornadoes are electric in nature or have a strong electrical component, you would think that therefore there would might be a gravity disturbance within a tornado. And since we are, and since we have people who have talked about things floating around within a tornado or nearby a tornado, that gives evidence that maybe we should look into the electric nature of tornadoes, which is another fascinating thing that we can do here on Earth. You know, you don't have to have, you know, thousands of dollars in your own spacecraft and, and your own space agency. You can go do that yourself. You can literally, you know, drive out to Kansas and sit around a tornado and talk to people and interview them and take pictures and who knows what else we can do. Another active area of study that we can actually get our hands dirty with. Okay, and another area that I wanna to try to get dirty with is the um, one of the more fascinating things in the uh, cosmos, the quasar. Of course, the uh, oh. idea that the black hole in the center of the universe uh, or the center of the galaxy, supermassive black hole is uh, causing the quasar because too much stuff is falling in it. Therefore, it's uh, it's spouting stuff out. Well, no, that's not the case, uh, what you would contend, because uh, you've had said that black holes, they only exist on paper, among other things. Well, okay, then how do you explain what a quasar actually is if that's right. what people are seeing and they're calling it a quasar? Well, my understanding is just a little different than, than what you've described. When I when I first started studying quasars, I, I didn't I couldn't tell what they were. You know, and the definition was really kind of nebulous. It just said this, you know, it stands for quasi stellar object. I'm like, what the heck is that? Essentially, a quasar, and, and again, this is the watered down, easy, digestible version, is a baby galaxy. And just like a baby, it was birthed or formed from a parent galaxy you can think of a galaxy as a quasar as like the center node the center you know how we see pictures of galaxies and the center of the galaxy is this really bright nucleus you can think of the quasar as that and then as it grows it, it gets the long arms on it but these bright massive ent celestial entities known as quasars apparently are birthed from galaxies and we know this because of the work of Halton Arp. In fact, his work alone, if, if your listeners have never heard of Halton Arp, this is, it's a tragedy. I hadn't heard of him until just recently, but he had his job. He was an astronomer and he worked with Edwin Hubble of you know the same name as the, as the uh, space telescope. Very well known, well, he was before he lost his job, uh, astronomer. And he found, he was looking at these quasars and he was looking at these galaxies. 
The current model, and let me see if I can keep this really simple. The current model is that quasars are really, really far away, meaning that they're the, they are at the edge of the observable universe. Galaxies, of course, are not. Galaxies are a lot closer. We, we can see them. You know, Andromeda is like, what, three million light years away. We got all sorts of galaxies that are close. But the quasars, as a group, are all on the edge of the universe. Halton Arp found conclusive evidence that that wasn't the case. And he has detailed them in, in books and in papers and in presentations over and over and over and over. The problem is the upshot of this and why he lost his job and why he was forgotten in the annals of history is because of what that discovery meant. The current model said that the age of the universe is shown by all the quasars and therefore, you know, the, the universe is 14.3 billion years old or, or um, like years like. Drew, did we just lose the signal again? Uh, yeah, I was on mute. Sorry. Um, yes, we, we did. However, I don't have to hang, out, hang up on you again because the recording this time started again at will somehow. Oh, so good. so oh. let's continue. Well, then I guess that wasn't OK. I don't know what's going on then. OK, let me just finish this with with the, the quasars and then we can see where we want to go from there. Halton Arp showed that the quasars were linked to their parent galaxies. And he showed that over and over and over, which meant that the entire size of the universe was in question and the entire age of the universe in question, including its genesis, including the beginning. Halton Arp's work clearly demonstrated that the Big Bang was BS. And that was too big a pill for, cosmo for, for astronomy to swallow. So instead of trying to verify his work or allow him to verify his work, they said, bye bye, you're gone, you're fired. And then he actually lost his job at the Palomar uh, Observatory. He actually had to go over to, uh, to Germany to finish his work there. But this whole idea revolves around what's called in science redshift. And redshift is just it, it's it's the Doppler effect for space. So the Doppler effect, everybody knows what it is. It's the sound that a train makes as it comes towards you, passes you, and then goes the, the other direction, especially if it's blowing its whistle. You know, you, is it coming towards you here? The sound is higher as it approaches you. It's lower as it recedes from you. And scientists thought, well, hey, if that works for sound, it probably works for light. And so they thought, well, hey, we see stuff that's red uh, out in space. And red is associated with longer wavelengths, which means it's traveling away from us. And blue light waves are coming toward us. So they figured that everything in the universe that was blue was coming toward us and everything that was red was going away from us. Well, quasars were very red. Galaxies were very blue. So you could never have a red quasar and a blue galaxy be connected to each other because they were, they were very, very, very far apart. They had to be. Our model said so. And again, Halton Arp clearly showed that these highly redshifted quasars were absolutely connected to their parent galaxy. He could see it. He imaged it. You could see the dust lanes connecting them. You could see the, the X-ray radiation connecting them. It completely destroyed the model of the Big Bang, the size and age of the universe. And instead of embracing that, he got kicked out and shunned. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. And as far as well, if there was no Big Bang, how to explain the universe, I like to think, uh, metaphysically speaking, the Matrix movie is a perfect analogy for how the universe actually works and that everything exists because our consciousness tells us it exists and we're all infinite. So the universe is right. infinite. There was no Big Bang. It's all infinite and there there was no beginning and there is no end because consciousness is, is infinite. But um, one thing that... Um, never seems to drive me crazy in regarding when will we'll, will we see the end of this is the suppression of 
the the truth or the ability for the truth to come out and um i think we might as well close on this uh on this, this interview with this subject um matter question of what can be done from a standpoint of the future to make sure that well among other things people that try to get the the truth out about what science should be saying and try to suppress the lies that mainstream science is saying and get the real truth out i mean these people should not be losing their jobs they shouldn't be shunned they shouldn't be reviled and uh, they they should be praised and well i'd like to think that what we're seeing right now in society with this um, global civilization shutdown under the guise of a virus is actually a cover story for what's really going on. I don't want to get into this too much, but in a nutshell, it's the um, control system on Earth is being taken up. It's being abolished. And that means all the suppressed science will, when this is all um, said and done, will also be abolished, which will open up the door for people like you and all the other scientists who want to get the truth out to be able to express the truth without having to worry about um, losing their jobs or being shunned and, and all the other unfortunate things that go with it. So I guess I might as well ask you the future of of this what do you see for the future um and uh i know time should be thought of as an illusion it's not the when it's the what as um people in the spiritual but not religious community say but uh, we might as well give a time frame based on probabilities and all when you think um things can certain things can come out like when do you see the day when they'll say the textbooks are wrong let's re let's burn them at the stake and rewrite them and um get the truth out and uh when will people not have to worry about being fired for getting the truth out and losing their jobs and uh well hopefully the day will come where all the suppressed technology that could um uh, provide for everyone is released so people don't have to work anymore to worry about losing <laughs> their jobs that would be great but that's wishful thinking of the highest degree and well um Hopefully, well, Tesla Tech, Electric Universe Theories, I'm sure they love Nikola Tesla stuff. And if only his technology could have um, been released and not suppressed by J.P. Morgan suppressed. and those jerks, it would have um, certainly been great for humanity. But maybe it will right. happen because, you know, Donald Trump's uncle was said to be one of the people who took Tesla's technology. But um, hopefully Trump, if he knows it, he's not having people suppress him from doing that, and he will be able to do that soon, the sooner the better. So when do you see, hopefully sooner the better, this future for humanity where we can get the truth out and we will see things like this being pushed and we can um, release technology that can provide for everyone and people won't have to worry about losing their jobs and, and all the rest well, that's, of it. That's, a, that's an interesting question. You asked when, and I think... Our, our, our tendency is to want to Hollywoodize this and look at it as a grand singular event. And it, and it may, there might be that. I, I don't, honestly, there's a part of me that hopes that it's not in one grand event because usually grand events are really disruptive, like the current situation. I mean, it is powerfully disruptive. I'm hoping that we're just going to progress one step at a time. And I don't want to say baby steps because that always bugs me. I don't want baby steps. I just want normal a walking gait, you know, just one step at a time. This interview here is going to change a few people, you know, open their eyes. And then the next interview will do the same thing and, and, and just create a wave that within our lifetimes brings about the change that we want. And, and we've seen that. We've seen great changes just within our lifetimes. I mean, you know, when you and I were born, cell phones were not a thing. Internet was not a thing. And yet now they're integral part of life. So those two things didn't happen as one big grand event. They were just natural outgrowths of communications uh, technology. And that's what I like to think is what's happening with the electric universe, too. People will see it, they'll get exposed to it, they'll go, oh my gosh, this makes sense. And oh my gosh, I can actually replicate the ideas of the Electric Universe in my garage. And oh, hey, uh, come here, neighbors, come and look at this. That's what I see is happening. It can happen as fast or as slow as people are willing to share these ideas with each other. So can it happen you know, tonight, tomorrow? You bet. Just depends on how fast these ideas get shared. Good answer. Uh, really can't provide a definitive answer because the future is always in motion, as Yoda 
told uh, right. Luke Skywalker <laughs> when he wanted to know the, what would happen to his uh, beloved sister and Han Solo and all the rest of them. So, well, the universe is always in motion. We don't really don't really know. And um, I, there are some who claim to the ability to look on future timelines, but well, there's timelines. It's not just one thing. There's probabilities, and we all have to do our part to try to get on the most positive timeline, and I will do what I can to make sure that that uh, is done with this interview. I will try to get it on a, by midnight tomorrow, I always promise my guests, um, and I will uh, get it to YouTube. I also upload it to cost.tv um, because I can't monetize on YouTube anymore. They blocked me with that. I reapplied on July 4th, and they say that because of the uh, uh, civilization shutdown, it's taking longer than normal, so you still have to wait. Well, I got a feeling they're never actually going to... Uh, let me monetize with ads again on YouTube. So I have to monetize with the blockchain on cost.tv. Um, I encourage all my listeners, please um, listen to my interviews um, from now on on cost.tv. Do listen to on the YouTube for just 15 seconds to get me a view credit because um, I certainly could use more um, YouTube subscribers doing two hour interviews. Uh, doesn't really help with a big audience because humans by nature have lousy attention spans and that kind of <laughs> sucks in regards to when it comes to getting uh, subscriptions at a fast rate. I recently had a guest unfortunately say, your audience is not big enough for me to come be worthy of coming on your show. Offer declined and what an insult. Oh. I mean, it's a shame that people wow. are like that. I mean, in this day and age, we need these um, people that have big audiences to come on people who have small audiences to help the people with small audiences uh, get more big audiences. Um, can't I, have I think we need, yeah. I, I think we just need people like you who are willing to step up and talk about it. Audience size to me is almost irrelevant because we need people to actually talk and say this because the momentum will grow organically if the message resonates. But boy, if you don't have someone like you who's just willing and able to talk, the momentum will never start. It'll never gather. So bravo, Drew. Good job. Yes. So why don't you get out anything you like now? And if you want to give out your contact info, the future of your uh, um, your information, you do have a Ben Hyde Spark Science YouTube channel that's uh, been around for, for at least five years, but I haven't had seven bubble in three months. If you're planning on doing more stuff for that, then uh, let us know. Um, maybe when we can expect to see more interviews and stuff like that. Uh, you try to make your stuff for the kids. I unfortunately, the, the new YouTube policy is, is, is it made for kids? And unfortunately, all my interviews, I have to say, no, it's not made for kids. But um, yeah. that, um, well, that's, but that's part of the problem. Is, yeah, that's your part of the problem is. with, right. That's, that was part of the problem I have with the YouTube channel is that the kids that I present to don't have YouTube accounts and, and are small. Right. And, and I can't publish any of the pictures and videos of me working with them because that's not a cool thing to do to publish pictures of other people's kids on a worldwide forum. So I've never done that. And any kids you see on my YouTube are usually my kids or my, or my family. But um, uh, the, most, the most current stuff that I do is actually on my Facebook page. So, and you can find that, uh, I, I think I've got a link on my YouTube channel to the Facebook page. If not, I'll put one up, but that's where I'm doing all of my experiments. That's how you can contact me, send me emails, call, text. It's all right there on my Facebook. So Ben Hyde Spark Science on Facebook. Thank you very much. Fascinating interview. I will get it up soon. I will send you a, uh, link to the interview as well you're more than welcome to upload it to your uh, spark science youtube channel as well um great. so uh have a great night hopefully we'll get out of this civilization shutdown thing sooner rather than <laughs> later and get the um stuff out that i see needing to get out and can get out if uh, the truth is the truth about how this um things are going to be more free for humanity when this is all said and done including the ability to uh get out electric universe theory and other suppressed science so have a great night good luck and take care fascinating interview pleasure thanks drew appreciate it have a good night Bye.